But investing, if I've lost money today, I have less money tomorrow to invest with. To become a, a decent investor, I mean just decent, is a year or two. That's just decent. That you, You're not even on the JV team yet. You're just learning the ropes. And, 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 and if you've made too many costly mistakes, by the time you become proficient and now you're really good, you got no capital left. In what kinds of, of positions, in real life you could call them situations, right? Do you tend to excel? And in which ones do you not? I wanted to start with a bit of a personal question, which is, uh, what do most people get wrong about the real you? They, I think they think that, that I'm in my head, but I'm actually not. I'm in my body most of the time. And I process information in my body, even when I'm reading, even when I'm thinking, even when I'm calculating. Can, can you tell me more about that? Like, where do you feel it? So, How do you feel? Yeah, so... Um, George Soros famously said that when his back is acting up, that he knows something is wrong in markets. So people have a, and even Einstein wrote about having a, a he said his, a, talked about a kinesthetic awareness. Mm -hmm. and, and if you think about it, if you think about human beings as animals, which we are, um, we learned to process information in our environment way before the Greeks invented logic, right? And even the word logic comes from the Greek word for logos and words. And human beings to survive had to, well, heck, animals to survive, process information in their bodies. And we've lost that as a, as a, as a, as a, as a world, as a species. We've lost the ability to process information in our body. So when I'm reading, when I read an idea, say in, in one of your podcasts, right? I read a transcript, I'm reading something or, or reading a quote or reading anything, I'll often pause. And when I say often, at least once a minute, I'll pause and I'll process it in my body. So what do I mean by processing? I'll just stop for a moment and see how it feels in my body. And then, so how do I reason with that? When I encounter a new idea, I'll say, oh, this feels like, I mean, it's not a conscious thought, but this feels like another thought that's related to it. And so I, I navigate the world, even of ideas, through my, my felt sense in my body. Yeah. I like that. It's almost like your subconscious is processing the environment. Exactly and right. You signals that you're not even aware of because your rational brain hasn't quite kicked in yet. Exactly right. And you think about it, that our species had many eons of evolution um, before we ever came up with logic and, and, and rationality and conscious thinking. And, uh, you know, there's that great book by uh, Julian Jaynes, The Origins of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. And his thesis was that consciousness, such as you and I experience it, like right now you and I are conscious that we are on a podcast talking to each other. Uh, but uh, if I'm walking down the street and I have a, a, a bag in my hand, I'm not conscious of the bag. And yet at no point do I ever let the bag go, hmm. right? And anyway, so I am unconscious of that. People who, who commute to work every day and anyone who's driven, say, for more than about a half hour, you experience this, this jolt frequently where you're driving along and all of a sudden you go, whoa, like out of nowhere you realize I've been totally oblivious to everything around me. 
for the last who knows how many minutes. And you know that you've you've stopped at lights. <laughs> you've avoided, you know, bumping into other cars. You've done a lot of things, but you weren't aware of it. And and um, so so clearly we can function when we are not conscious. And Julian Jaynes uh, thesis in his book is that is that consciousness is pretty darn recent in human history. And by pretty darn recent, he he said somewhere in the last, oh, somewhere between Homer, between the Odyssey and the Iliad, the Odyssey, and what was the other book Homer wrote? Anyway, between the two Homer novels, that uh, uh, poems, um, consciousness was born <laughs> in the human species. So only about two, 3,000 years ago, and um, and he said, I realize what, what I am saying. I am saying that the pyramids were constructed by people who were not conscious, who were functioning, who developed mathematics and were able to put, you know, multi-ton stone blocks into place and they weren't conscious. <laughs> and which is a wild thesis and... Uh, and it's a, it's a brilliant book, The Origins of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. And he, um, you know, it's, it's been critiqued um, uh, uh, over the years, but it's still brilliant. It's still a lucid uh, exemplar of um, how a philosophy book could be written if the author strove for clarity as opposed to showing you how smart he or she is. In a sense, a conversation arose in our brain. And at the time we weren't aware of it, before, before again, he calls it the breakdown of the bicameral mind. Bicameral is uh, two chambers, uh, uh, like the uh, 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 Congress, you have the Senate, and the House of Representatives, bicameral, right? Two chambers. And so the, the left and the right brain, the breakdown, he said, it's been many years since I read it as a, as a teenager. He, he said um, that conversation arose and we didn't know where it was coming from. And we attributed it to the gods that there must be something outside of us, this voice, because when the first- Sending us a message. Right, sending a message, exactly. And uh, so I think, I think that's something that people should really learn to get in touch with um, is, uh, and I'm not, this isn't touchy-feely, I mean in a practical way. And mm. you know, one of the things I, I wanted to say at the beginning, Shane, um, one of the things I, well, one of the many things I love about you is that you are on a constant hunt, a safari for usable information, really usable. And I, I wanted to, to, to emphasize um, both of us, to anyone listening to us right now, that everything here, the goal is to provide practical, useful information, not, oh, that's an interesting idea, right? This is this is the uh, the upgrade hour <laughs> with uh, Shane and Adam, right? And how to upgrade yourself. How do we use it? Yeah, that's a key question for me. You know, one thing I've been dying to talk to you specifically about, given your knowledge of chess and decision making, is sort of the concept of positioning. And I've been uh, noodling on this idea, I think, since we, we last spoke, actually. It's been a number of years. And it, it seems to me that the best decision makers in the world almost always operate from a position of strength. And that, that sort of strikes me because when you operate from a solid position or foundation, nearly every move you make is good. It's all accumulative. Uh, whereas when you operate from a poor position, things almost always go from bad to worse. To what extent do you feel that's important? And maybe you could explore that with me. Sure, sure. So, um, well, like you, Shane, I try to reduce uh, the world, the complexities of the world to um, usable little rules, <laughs> um, maxims, 
right? Principles, algorithms, heuristics, um, so that in the real time flux of life, I remember to do something and not, you know, some other time. So one of my principles is um, never make a decision when I'm confused. Now that's like, okay, well, that doesn't sound like such a big deal, but I have made decisions when I was confused or tired or stressed. You and I would call it in, in the stupid zone. And, and, um, and it's important to remember those things in real time. Again, a feeling state. Actually, there's a great book on feeling states. Um, and it's written, it's a book called The Gift of Fear. The Gift of Fear. And it's written by a guy named Gavin De Becker, who's brilliant, really brilliant. The book is full of so many uh, uh, insights, really a philosopher, that, that dude. Um, I believe he was for a while, he became the chief of security for Bezos, may still be. But anyway, The Gift of Fear, what's that book about? And uh, um, Oprah raved about it when it came out. I think it came out about 25 odd years ago. And his principle was this, uh, sorry, his main thesis was this. Um, it was a book on how to be street smart. Hmm. So you're walking down the street, let's say it's at night in a city you don't really know. And you have a vague sense something is off. And that's your intuition tapping you on the shoulder saying, get out of here. Yeah. Um, and yet we look around, our conscious mind looks around for, for why am I feeling like this? And we don't act in the moment. And it's really key. Um, now, I say that this is a book about being street smart. Again, the gift of fear in real time. So I know, uh, here's another maxim that I've uh, sort of a riffing on his point. Whenever things are a little strange, they're very strange. So that I know in a public setting, if I'm walking, I walk into a room and I go, huh, if something is, seems a little bit off, then I, then it's really off and I don't wait to um, figure out, to assess the situation. I remove myself from it immediately. And that's true. So here we're talking about street smart. The same principle can be applied to an investment or a negotiation or a hiring decision or heck, getting married, whatever it is. The key decisions in life we make them rationally, and yet our body is giving us information all the time that we ignore and uh, we dismiss, um, which is being stupid. Um, but we haven't trained ourselves in a, um, each of us as individuals. So you, the listener, listening to Shane and Adam uh, riff on this stuff, um, the way your body processes information and your intuitive insights about the world, about others, it's going to have a different vocabulary from Shane's or Adam's. And you have to learn that. And, um, you know, actually, I'll share, with, I, I, I'll share a, uh, a memory I have. One of the most extraordinary experiences I ever had in my entire life. So this occurred about 30 years ago. It's a Sunday morning. Um, I'm in New York City. Uh, I'm going to say it's about seven, seven o'clock in the morning on a Sunday, and I'm out jogging in Central Park. So that's the picture. So you could picture it in your head. And it's a beautiful Sunday morning. I'm jogging. There are a few people out, but not that many. Seven o'clock on a Sunday. And um, I'm, I'm running, um, those of you who are familiar with Central Park, um, I'm running 
near the the museum of uh, uh, the, the Metropolitan, near the the Metropolitan on the east side. I'm running, beautiful, I'm, and all of a sudden I go, ah! I jump and I leap laterally about ten feet out of nowhere, and my heart is pounding. Did, I didn't tell you this story, did I, Shane? No. Okay, my heart is pounding. Okay, what the hell is? I mean, I'm jogging along, I go, ah, and I leapt. I mean, laterally, like 10 feet. Like, I still don't know how I did it. And my heart is pounding. I'm going, what the heck? And I'm like, I'm looking around and like, what the heck is going on? And I'm kind of embarrassed. Like, <laughs> like, did anyone see me do that? And um, I'm trying to catch my breath. And my eye scans up the embankment. And about... 15 feet, so the embankment is about 15 feet, and then there's a lot of a shrubbery, Central Park, full of dense shrubbery and stuff. There's a crouching mountain lion. A crouching mountain lion. Now, it's a statue, but you can look this up. It It's like it's hunched like this, about to leave. Yeah. And it's... It's uh, because of the copper patina and everything or the bre- whatever it is, um, it's meant to be hidden. Now, most people, when they see it, they look at it, and they, they spot it, but it's directly. But I didn't spot it directly. It came in through my peripheral vision. So my caveman brain said, get out of here. And I reacted before I had any idea like, uh-oh, you're about to get eaten. And and it was my first, well, I, think I had another experience kind of like that, but of what it must have been like to live with no thoughts or words. That, Self-preservation is a powerful instinct. Yeah. But, but see, let's, let's get away from the word instinct because it was a clear, um, I mean, it was an instinct, of course but that I was acting and that I was programmed to act before I thought. Because obviously, if you were an analytic type and said, huh, why am I feeling that? Uh, you're, 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 You're that crouching mountain lion's lunch. It's like we have defaults. Yeah. And so, so again, that the alarm that my body felt and it just, I spr- I wasn't, there wasn't even a millisecond. I just leapt. And, um, cause, and, and even to this day, I don't know how I physically could have moved that far, but I did. And, uh, and the survival of, of, of my ancestors depended on doing that. Um, totally right. And, and so even though that's a, even though the book, Gavin's book, uh, De Becker's book, the gift of fear is about being street smart. Well, that, that same intuition is speaking to you all the time about various dangers in your environment, whether they're investing dangers or relationship dangers or contractual dangers, whatever it is. Um, and to not, not ignore that. And in, in fact, the opposite really, um, uh, refine that, that you, the instrument of your body as a, as a, um, as an early warning system and as totally. a, as a computer in its own right. I want to come back to sort of chess and positioning and yeah. how that affects our ability to make decisions that accumulate or um, multiply by zero almost. Sure. How do you think about that? So chess, chess is an amazing game that I love. Um, as, as, a, as, an, as an exemplar, as a paradigm for life, we have to be careful because the chess board, so I'm going to contrast chess with poker and we'll talk about positions. Right. So so um, um, chess, if you if Shane and Adam are playing a game of chess, we see all the pieces. It's not Mm -hmm. like, 
you've got a, a piece behind your back that you're hiding. And Adam, look at that. And I look away and you put the piece on the board. Oh, no. Yeah. We see, I see everything that you see. You have complete information. Complete information, right? Complete information. And you know this because you're such a, a scholar of Buffett. Um, he and uh, Charlie Munger talk, uh, uh, they're very keenly aware of, have I thought this through correctly? Right? We're going to get to that and AI and chess and positions. We're going to weave all that together because your question is so profound. So, um, so the chessboard, I see everything. And in my calculus, I am taking into account the fact that I could be mistaken. I can make mm -hmm. a mistake and I wouldn't know it. In other words, if you make a mistake in your reasoning, or you overlook something, by definition, you're not aware of it. Mm -hmm. But in the game of poker, I don't see your full hand. I don't even know the cards that I'm going to get. Right? And so I'm assessing um, all kinds of probabilities, right? And then on top of that, even if I had all of, all of the cards, I could also make an error in my judgment. And so one thing is to, to be aware of um, positions that you excel in, right? Uh, 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 again, you being such a, a scholar of, of uh, 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 the resident at uh, Farnham Street, <laughs> um, that uh, Buffett and Munger um, are keenly aware of the kinds of industries that they know well and the kind of situations those companies in those industries they're completely familiar with them and so when you talk about good positions let's talk about that notion so even without knowing anything about chess or not much about chess if you the listener um uh, the chess board is uh, the, some pieces are on the board and they're placed in an arrangement, which is known as the position. Think of it as, as like on the football field with your players arranged or the basketball court, like where's your center, where's your, you know, all of this. And, and so I know, I, Adam, know that there are certain kinds of positions I do very well in. I like them more, you know? I like uh, quiet, uh, slow mm. positions where there's not much interaction with um, um, my opponent's pieces for about 10 or 20 moves. I like kind of getting my pieces all arranged just so before the battle starts, right? And so, there are certain openings, like anyone who's watched The Queen's Gambit. The Queen's Gambit is an opening. Um, and um, speaking of which, um, um, so, so the positions that arise from The Queen's Gambit, you, Shane, might like those positions. And I, Adam, just because just of my, eh, aesthetically, I just, I don't like those positions. Or... I tend not to do well in those positions, right? So I'll steer the game as much as I can from the very opening to positions that are of my liking, mm -hmm. right? In other words, I'll engineer that. And, um, and, and, and that also is a really important uh, skill for, for anyone to develop is in what kinds of, of positions, in real life you could call them situations, right? Do you tend to excel? And in which ones do you not? A, a trader, for example, might know that there's a certain kind of, I don't do well the, the opening hour, I'm always messed up and, you know, um, or I don't like dealing with uh, Fed report days, like, you know, when the FOMC is about to make an announcement, I'm just, I'm not going to look at the markets during those days. 
And so we learn the kinds of positions in which we excel. And I don't think that uh, there's any hard and fast rule because the ones that I like, Shane, you might go, Adam, I, I don't like any of those positions. And then with poker, I guess there, there's a lot more uncertainty, but then uh, how you bet and how you place those bets leads you to a better or worse position. So you might have the best hand in the world, but if you have no chips left, you're in a bad position to take advantage of it. You know what? It's so funny you mentioned that. That's um, So I think we talked about this, but I'm not sure. Um, there's two ways to live your life. One of them is um, avoiding pain, mm -hmm. and the other is seeking pleasure. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and you know uh, uh, better than anyone, uh, Buffett's first rule of investing, never lose money, right? And rule number two, never forget rule number one. And so why is that important? Because his, his insight, and it's a genius insight, is you can't help but make money over time just because human enterprise that is learning and accumulating and growing. So over time, the value of any enterprise, of any business, uh, is going to grow. And so as long as you avoid loss, um, your money will grow. And, 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 and someone asked me, but Adam, you said in chess, Fisher always played to win and he didn't mind losing. Versus investing, you say, don't lose money. And here's why. If you think about it, and it took me a while, I went, oh yeah, this is why. Because in a, in a chess game, if I lose it, the next round, tomorrow, I'm the same chess player. Right. I haven't lost anything. Maybe I'm pissed off, whatever. But in fact, well, I wouldn't be. But but you know, when you when you learn to compete, you learn not to you learn to shake things off and not get get emotional about things. But investing, if I've lost money today, I have less money tomorrow to invest with. And the problem with a lot of people in investing is they they're learn to become a a decent investor. I mean, just decent is a year or two. That's just decent. That you you're not even on the JV team yet. You're just learning the ropes. And 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 if you've made too many costly mistakes, by the time you become proficient. And now you're really good. You got no capital left. Yeah. Right. That's the that's the problem with with uh, the learning curve of investing, is uh, is that by the time you're smart <clears throat> um, about investing, uh, you, you, you could very well have lost a lot of money. L let's let's talk about AI and Chat GPT. I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of these developments recently, and and yeah. where you see the world going, and maybe what scares you and what excites you. So OpenAI was started by Musk and uh, Sam Altman, who's I think running it now. Reid Hoffman, a bunch of his uh, old posse, and uh, it was started with the noble belief that AI is too important in the world to be owned by any one uh, company or, or, or country. It's just too, the stakes are too big. It's gotta be a, a global commons, like a shared resource. It's just, it's too important. And um, so OpenAI was born. Um, now it, it's not quite as open as it used to be. There's some other open source companies like um, Stability AI, and, and there's, I think, one or two others. And, and so, so ChatGPT is fascinating. And really, everyone should be using it right now. So in its trivial thing, it can answer questions like, um, you, you could open up your refrigerator 
uh, see what items you have in the refrigerator and in your pantry and say, I'm preparing a dinner party for vegans. Give me some menus and it'll, you know, it can answer questions like that. It's pretty impressive. But what excites me most about, about uh, chat GPT, and again, um, that's what we know about has been released. You got to believe that there are um, companies and government organizations that are way ahead of what you and I see as ChatGPT for. Like always keep that in mind. So, um, so I use it as a thought partner. I use it to 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 help me ask better questions. The key thing is not that it can answer questions. Um, it's that it gives me a tool to ask even better questions in the same way that Yo-Yo Ma can coax more um, beautiful music out of a cello than you or I could. I, I don't know how to play the cello. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, Yo-Yo Ma can, can take a cello and, and get it to do way more than any other cellist. And in the hands of a master, what you can do with ChatGPT as a, as a, as a thought partner, as a, I give you a perfect example. You could say, um, um, let's say I'm, I'm, um, I want to come up with a new product, you know? and uh, I could describe the product. I could describe the kinds of, of um, ah, here, simple example. I'm a used car salesman. I could describe the car and, um, and say, what kinds of questions will people ask about that car? And, and, and might, might say something and go, whoa, whoa, I, I would have forgotten to, to deal with that. I have to have an answer to that question, right? And uh, you, So it can train you. Exactly right. Forget training chat GPT. It's training Adam. This is the Shane and Adam upgrade show, right? Like, oh, yeah, it's training that. But I, I'm getting better and better at asking questions going, oh, that's right. Now, most of the time, this is interesting because I've, I've tested ChatGPT. The way to think about it is, um, is that it, it's a super smart, um, uh, lightning fast research assistant. Hmm. It doesn't come up with insights. It, it doesn't. And I fed it situations where I had an insight, like around the Princeton Review and things that I know about markets. So I'd, I'd give it the data I had. It, it's not able to make, it's not able to make, it's able to make logical conclusions. Um, think of it as a, it's a really good deductive analytic machine. Um, uh, but it's not yet capable of making logical leaps that aren't evident from from the domain, it's not going to. Well, in areas, in areas where you're an expert, it, it's probably not that useful, and it's often wrong. Well, but I don't care. Even when it's wrong, it tells me why would it have thought that? Right. Exactly. Right. And so, even when ChatGPT is wrong, it's useful. Again. I'm not using it for its completeness. Hmm. I'm not. Um, I used to give students an exercise. The key thing in school right now, this is really important. It's the key to the future. It's the key for everything, not just school, is when you've got machines that can answer anything, the edge is who asks the best questions. That's key. And the better questions you can ask, the more you're going to get out of the 
out of uh, whatever AI thing you're using. So how do we learn how to ask better questions then? A good question is one that prompts other questions. Hmm. Or a good question is one, here's another uh, way to come at it. A good question is one that um, increases the choices that I have. So um, I, Adam, as a decision maker. So here, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, um, that goes back to positioning, right? Because if you're in a good position, you have more choices than if you're in a bad position. Exactly right. You want to maximize the number of choices that you've got always. Now, at a certain point, you've got to rein that in and come to a decision and rule out all the choices. But you want to see the choices, at least initially, as long as you're not overwhelmed by them. Like a CEO of a company does not want the chief marketing officer to give him 47 different choices. Give me three and I'll make the call, but don't, I don't want to have to deal with, you know, 47 choices, but at least initially you just sort of like, okay, let me see what my choices are. And then we got to start narrowing it down. But here, here's an example um, that people can use right now. This is the Shane and Adam upgrade hour. Um, Whenever you find yourself asking, how do I X? Mm -hmm. How do I get to uh, uh, um, uh, London quickly? Or how do I increase um, marketing? How do I increase sales and also increase the sales price of the the item I'm Mm -hmm. selling? How do I do that? Instead of asking, how do I? Ask the following question, who knows how to do whatever that is? So all of a sudden, instead of my trying to figure out how I, Adam, ought to do it, Mm -hmm. I've got lots of choices. Now it's, okay, I got to find someone who knows that. And that gives me lots of choices instead of my thinking, okay, what are my constraints? What am I doing here? Um, So that's an example. Um, this is, uh, here's one that I, a little more sort of personal to, to human beings. Um, I, I often go to Google and run what I call Google experiments. So I will type in the beginning of a question and see what it auto suggests, right? It auto completes, right? And I think we talked about this, uh, yeah, right? It, how can I learn to? If you type in how can I learn to, you'll see the number one question people ask on, on the internet is how can I learn to love myself, right? And But here's a question that, here's a better question because we're talking about making questions better. Here's a better question than how can I learn to love myself is, how can I learn to love? Hmm. Let's remove yourself and all that judgment around it. Okay, how can I learn? What does loving mean? What does that mean to love? <laughs> Let's take it away from myself for the moment. By the way, yeah. that's not my question. It's what Google pulls up, right? And by the way, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, um, um, Google is great. Um, because you can just type in questions um, here. Suppose I was a um, a coffee company, right? And I want to, what are people curious about? I could type in a question like this. Why does coffee, and see what it auto-completes, right. you might say, give me gas. Yes. And I'll know, oh, I should address that in marketing. I didn't know that. Yes. Or I could be a lingerie designer. <laughs> um, uh, where can I find lingerie that and just see what it, you know, is edible <laughs> or whatever. Um, and so to see the kinds of questions that people come up with. And, and, and it's, it's a really important exercise um, that, uh, you know, the problem with the Socratic method 
<laughs> is that Socrates, the teacher, is doing all the work. Yes. Right? You have to do the work to get the... To, to know the, the questions to ask, right? And it, it's... Think about school. The teacher asks the questions and the students, you know, raise their hand and give the answer. That's machines yeah. are going to do that. You got to know what questions to ask. Yes. Right. Yeah. And and uh, and even there, I'll introduce the notion of the question behind the question. So, for example, a friend could come up to me and say, uh, uh, Adam, you know any good books on meditating? Well, what's the question behind that? <laughs> Why do you want a book on meditating? Oh, because I want to give it to my teenage daughter because she's stressed in school. And I figured if she had, because if he said my teenage daughter is stressed. Right. And she's, I'm trying to offer ways, constructive ways that she can handle the stress. And I was thinking meditating. I don't know any good books, it. right? It, by giving me the context, he gives me, Adam, more choices in mm -hmm. how to come at it, right? And go, well, the best way to learn meditating is not from a book. That's just going to get her in her head, Yeah. right? And they're physical things. And because I know your daughter is a dancer, she might like this kind of movement meditation, right? So... So uh, it was uh, General Patton who said, never tell your men, because he was a, a general, never tell your men uh, how to do anything. Tell them what to do and let them surprise you with their ingenuity. All right. And um, but even that, even that, suppose General Patton said, we need to take that hill. Now, in battle, you got to take the hill. You, you don't have the perspective and you can't go, huh, maybe Eisenhower or Patton was wrong. Maybe we shouldn't take that hill. Maybe we should take that other hill. That's better. And, uh, you know, maybe his uh, chief of staff might say, uh, you know, uh, General Patton, uh, that hill's pretty good, but there are two hills. Are you sure you want to do that one? You know, obviously when you're, when you're executing a, in, in a battle, you just got to execute the command, right? But in, yes. Um, but as uh, as managers, as bosses, as teachers, as parents, in relationships, the more choice we can give the other person, which is to say the context, which is to say to go back to your word, the position. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then I'll know. Oh, your real question is this. Oh, here's a great example. Uh, I remember, um, wow, I learned this in high school. So um, I don't think we talked about this, Shane. Um, okay, I I'm, I'm, I'm just want to get my head around the anecdote. Okay, a, um, a state-of-the-art uh, um, office complex goes up. And from day one, there are complaints from all the tenants about the wait for the elevator takes forever to, for the elevator to arrive. And uh, so they call in one engineer after the next. And uh, they say, well, you can increase the speed by having an express elevator. And these are the three most frequented floors in terms of elevator times that we've tested. So just right. dedicate one to go to that. Anyway, so they all worked around um, um, how, to, how to decrease the wait time. Because that was the question. How can we decrease the wait time? But that wasn't the problem. The problem was not that people waited. The problem was that people complained about the waiting. And so they, uh, a, a, um, and, uh, they bring in an architect. And he, he says, oh, you don't have to speed up the elevators. Just put mirrors in, in every waiting area. And that's so why when you go to themselves and distract them. exactly right. Now it's not a pro problem solved. Didn't have to speed up the elevators. So also, why you, I, I assume you walk so long at airports to get your bags when you check them in, right? Because they want to make that a long path so you don't stand around the machine and feel like you're waiting. Oh, well, there you go. And so 
you think about like the lines in banks or, or motor vehicle bureaus, they could do stuff with that weight. Well, right now everyone has a, a smartphone, so you can pull that out. Yeah, yeah, or, totally. Or we don't can, like we don't like being in our own head. Right, yeah, exactly right. Um, first, you want to get to the question behind the question. What's the real question we're dealing with here, right? Totally. And one is a yeah. tenant revolt. Oh, man, um, they're complaining about the elevator weight. And uh, by the way, if you go to any hotel, pretty much every hotel has mirrors in the uh, as you're waiting for the elevator and, and a lot yeah. of office buildings. Anyway, you're, so you're solving the root cause, not the symptom. The symptom is like people are bored and then they're noticing it. And then the root cause is sort of like you can fix that in multiple ways, but you can distract them as a me mechanism to change the feeling people are having. I'm going to jump on the word you use, distract. Okay. okay? But it's great. Yeah, yeah. No, it's great because I, 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 I would use the word distract too, but let's improve even that. So okay. what we're doing is we're inviting the tenant to use the time in another way, mm -hmm. right? As opposed to a distraction, like distracting from the, right? A distraction assumes if I'm trying to focus on writing a paper, right? then noise outside is a distraction from that. Totally. Right? Um, so we could invite, so it's a more positive framing and framing is a big thing at, at, uh, at uh, Farnham street, right? Your the mo mental models and frames. And so the, instead of the distraction frame, huh, we're giving them more choices, what to do with their time. Totally. Yeah. You could look at yourself. That's a very positive, uh, framing of that. Yes. Yeah. I like it. I want to, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about how we become a learning machine. I might, I might describe actually life as learning. That's what life is. A plant doesn't, I know a plant is alive, but it doesn't really learn anything. It can't modify its behavior. Right. And I mean, it doesn't preset ways, right? Like heliotropic, it'll turn towards the sun. But its, it's responses, its range of responses, pretty limited. And so, as human beings, we learn, and we should be learning um, every day. We should be learning okay. every day. There's an old joke uh, um, at the end of uh, uh, a third grader goes up to his teacher at the end of the day and asks the teacher, um, um, uh, "Miss Johnson, what did we learn today?" And Miss Johnson says, well, why do you want to know, Tommy? She says, because my parents are going to want to know when I get home and I want to tell them what I learned <laughs> today. <laughs> and so, but I, that's a question I could pose to everyone listening right now. What did right. you learn today? And she, you want to go to bed smarter than when you woke up. Yes, in concrete ways. So Shane, every day, okay, I'm going to make an outrageous statement. Um, I, Adam, know more about financial markets than any other living person. Okay. So that's an outrageous statement. How can I make that? Because um, every day so I created software to test ideas about markets. Mm -hmm. So back in the day, uh, say be be before the internet, if Shane, you had a question or I had a question or whoever's listening to this right now, you the listener, if you had a question pre-internet days, you'd sit there going, is it worth my while to make a one hour trip to the public library, maybe find a book on the topic, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe that relevant book will have an answer and maybe the answer will be something that I can actually use. So you're looking at a two or three hour investment. And most of the time you wind up going, nah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now on the internet, you can do that in milliseconds. You go, huh, let's just check that out. Right? So now imagine that in markets. 
So well, what what you've really accelerated is sort of like the learning cycles. Exactly, exactly. Because you remove the friction, like instead of taking three or four hours to learn something, now it takes milliseconds, perhaps. Exactly right. Which just goes back to what I was talking about with the with the uh, uh, neural nets, right? My learning cycle back then for a neural net was a week. Right. To to test one model. I'll yeah. bring it back to my old Princeton Review days. So, so uh, you you may know if you're a listener. I, back in the day, I co-founded the Princeton Review with John Katzman, and when I started off, I um, I was a tutor. And in the early days, I was tutoring um, ten to twelve hours a day, seven days a week. Do the math. Yeah, that meant. I was seeing 60 to 90 kids a week. That's crazy. I know. And people don't believe me until I show them old schedule, um, uh, you know, weekly calendars that I had from back then. And um, I still remember I was seeing kids every hour on the hour from seven in the morning till seven or eight at night. And, um, and, and, uh, I remember there's this one girl, I still remember her name, Hannah. She calls up and says, Adam, all my friends are using you. I have to come at the, uh, you know, this is before we had created formal courses. And uh, she said, I I have to, please, can you see me? And I looked at my schedule and I I just smiled. I said, nah, I really don't have any time unless you want to come at six in the morning. And just like that, she said, okay. She didn't negotiate. She didn't say, couldn't you make it 630? She just, she said, okay. Anyway, so think about that, Shane. I had 60, and I taught each kid each week the same test, which meant I had 60 to 90 learning cycles on every single question in the test. So I would try out different explanations as I went through the week. By the time it was Wednesday, I you basically knew every error that a kid was going to make yeah. on that test. I would know on question 13, the kid probably chose C. Like, I, you know, and I would so, know so why. Is, is, that the, is that the key to learning then? Accelerating the number of learning cycles and getting feedback and then reflecting on that feedback. Exactly right. So, so with markets, so to go back to markets. So if I want to test an idea, here's an idea. Um, uh, JP Morgan is, uh, is uh, one of the premier banks in the world. And it's one of the, the key, uh, uh, um, um, it's one of those sort of a, an exemplar of the notion of too big to fail. <laughs> When the Fed gets in trouble and calls a lot of bankers and financial types in to like come help us, they'll call yeah. Jamie Dimon. <laughs> like he's at the head of their list, right? And so, so suppose I wanted to test the idea if JP Morgan is outperforming other banks, is that good or bad for the banking sector, for banking stocks in general, and over what time frame? So before I created my software, if I wanted to test that question, I'd have to download the data. <laughs> I'd have to get JP Morgan closing stock data for the last you know, 40 odd years. Then I'd have to think of all the things I wanted to test it against, banks, maybe 10 year yields, maybe, maybe the broad market, put all of that in to a spreadsheet set up conditions like define outperforming, right? And then set up all these conditions. I'm saying all this for a reason, even if you're not interested in finance, um, you the listener. It took me about an hour to set all that up. And at the end of the day, I might go, oh, it doesn't tell me anything about, right? And I've just spent an hour. Well, I... I paid some programmers to hard code what I normally do using Excel. 
So I can answer that question in about five seconds now. Something that used to take an hour, I'd go, probably not my worth looking at, right? And then yeah. is I can answer a question like that on financial markets. And by the way, I will tell you, JP Morgan's outperforming does tell you something <laughs> about those who want to look it up. It does tell you something. Um, and uh, um, in, in, a, in a counterintuitive way, actually. Um, Oh, wait, you can't just leave it at that. Well, uh, <laughs> it's, 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 so uh, JP Morgan's outperforming is not, is not, is a uh, slightly bearish for financial stuff. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's slightly outperforming. Uh, sorry. It's slightly bearish, not usually so. And when it's underperforming, it's slightly good. Now, again, you have to define just like with ChatGPT or anything, you have to def uh, define outperforming. Like, so what do I mean by that? Over what time frame is it outperforming? By how much? But I can put all of that in and just say broadly, JP Morgan's outperforming is not good for financial stocks and not good for, and, and also not great for the broad market. And uh, when you think about it intuitively, there's a little, um, there's a little bit of flight to safety there. It's mm -hmm. the safest banking stock. So if it's outperforming, right. people are a little scared. Right. right. But this I can't reveal. But if you add in one more condition, um, it's really bearish <laughs> with adding in one more condition that I got to test about three minutes later. I, that I can't reveal. <laughs> um, but if you add in another condition, it's really bearish. And and the flip side is the opposite conditions. It's hugely bullish. To give you it, so what you what you really did was sort of like take away the time to get the learning cycle complete, right? Like you're it, you're inputting a question. There's almost no friction between the question and the response. Exactly, and I get then to modify the question. Right. Okay. Now. Now you can spend an hour modifying the question. Or I can spend a, or even 10 minutes and I keep getting to iterate. And each time I learn something new, which suggests further questions, right? Yeah. So I'll give you an example. So how does someone apply that in their lives? You want to increase the learning cycles. So there's a great book. I think you've mentioned it before. That there's um, I think the, the Talent Code. And mm -hmm. uh, what's that guy's name? Croyle or... Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, brilliant book. Great, great book. I think it was in that book. Um, um, and they talk about um, how Brazilians play soccer really well. I right? remember that. Yeah. And, and one of the ways they play is to have instead of a hundred, a hundred, like a, 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 a instead of playing on a, a field that's like a football size. Yeah. They shrink it down so it's like 30 feet, which means that the learning cycles are much faster. They have to take more shots. They have to pass more often. It's accelerated. So, so you want to anytime, if you're an organization, right, you want to find ways to increase the number of learning cycles that every one of your employees goes through. Um, an example of this um, – a few summers ago, um, I was walking down uh, Fifth Avenue and uh, with a friend, and I uh, there were three young kids. I'm going to say the kids were uh, kids, college kids. They were clearly like you know, late teens, early twenties, and they were raising money for um, for um, SaveTheChild.org, SaveTheChild.org, and uh, I watched them for a while. And each one of them approached passersby on a beautiful Saturday. The sun was out, people going about their business. And they would stop passersby and say, excuse me, sir. And New Yorkers are just trained. Sorry, I'm in a rush right now. I, I gave it the office, whatever it is, right? So I watched them for about five minutes with my friend. And I said, can I just want to do something. So I, I called all three of the kids together, right? They're college kids. And I said, I'll give you 
if you'll listen to me for five minutes, is that a deal? They said, yes, it is. Cause I made probably their weekly quota. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And um, so I said, I've been watching you for the last five minutes and each one of you approaches passersby with basically the same thing. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir, or ma'am, or whatever. And I said, has that been working for you guys? No, it hasn't. Well, then why don't you try different things? Why don't you walk into someone and go, I have the funniest joke for you, sir, or whatever. Try different things and see what works. Now, um, I actually, um, they said, wow, that's such a good idea. I don't know whether they did. And I gave them, you know, I signed up and I gave them actually more than 500. Um, and I even wrote to the head of savethechild.org and say, you have a network of thousands of devoted experimenters who are out there who could be doing learning. So let's find out what's the best phrase to get people to stop. And by yeah. the way, maybe approaching a couple, this is the phrase to use when it's a couple. Always approach the woman and say this, right? Um, or if it's a single person, or maybe you approach men and women differently, or groups, how do you do that? And I said- Thousands of people running these experiments, and there's, there's sort of like no intentional iteration, and then there's no learning after something is successful. It's not passed on. Not passed you- on at all. Now there's, there's a kind of business that does that very well, franchises. Mm -hmm. So franchises, there could be a franchisee say of McDonald's in Buffalo, New York, who goes, Oh, on rainy days, use this phrase because everybody buys milkshakes. Mm -hmm. So when you go into a McDonald's, um, pretty much doesn't matter what you, you order, they will say, would you like fries with that? Mm. Now that phrase was discovered by a girl. I, I believe it was a teenage girl, I forget what town, but she discovered that a lot of people said, sure, why don't you throw in some fries? And they discovered 7% of the people say yes to that. That's one person in 14. That's a mega kick in French fry yeah. sales. Now, yeah. probably not too good for the health of the nation, but, but again, Matt, from a sales the, perspective, the number yeah. of, of experiments that you do, your learning cycles, and each one, you have a clear objective. So right now you see me with my top hat on and uh, I've taken to wearing this, um, I bought it uh, um, uh, two summers ago. I was walking by a, a, a hatter in New York, a proper hatter who makes hats for people. Uh, milliners make hats for women. Anyway, and I see this hat in the window and it just, I just smile when I saw it. And I walked in and, uh, and I got one. So this is made to me, my head. And why do I say that? Shane, if you were in New York, um, and next time you are, we will do an experiment. You and I will walk down uh, a street, say in Soho, and I promise you that at least once a block, I will get compliments, at least once a block. Amazing. And if I'm seated in a restaurant, um, I'll get approached at least once a meal. I say at least once. and. Often when people are leaving and they always have a big smile on their face, kids, adults, men, women, um, it does. It, and uh, now what's interesting is I, I got such a good response with this. Why am I saying that? Because I have a, a hat, a top hat just like this with, with, with a little bit bigger that gets no responses, none whatsoever. None. Huh. I have no idea why. I have no idea why, but I don't wear that one too much because it's fun for me when people say, hey, nice hat. And it's always with a smile. That, that, that's key. 
in terms of like, you're just opening yourself to serendipity. You didn't do it for a reason, but then when you got feedback that it made people smile, it makes you almost want to wear it more. It does. Absolutely. Who doesn't yeah, like exactly. seeing people smile when you, when they see you? One thing we talked about last time I want to get to before we wrap up here is uh, we talked about sort of ways to avoid stupidity and you had written a book on how not to be stupid and you haven't published that yet. And I'm wondering why and when that's going to be available for everybody. Every year on his birthday and at Christmas, I send Buffett a present. And, um, and so every year, so his birthday is, uh, it's the end of August and Christmas is Christmas. Mm-hmm. Um, so every year, about a month before that day, I'm like, oh, man, what am I going to do this year? Because it's not an easy person to, to, to get a present get for, presents for, right? It's not like he needs another tie, right? Um, and uh, so once, um, one year I sent him a nickel. So, but it was a special nickel. So every... Um, to amuse myself um, over the years, I've adopted the practice. If I have any coins in my pockets, of course, at the end of the day, you take them out of your pockets. I spill them out on a table and I search through them to see if I can find any old coin. And I define an old coin as, um, as um, um, anything before 1960. Okay. So I, the oldest coin I've have so far is a 1907 penny. It's worth okay. 300 bucks. I found it. I, I, not like I'm going to sell it, but just, wow, I found an old coin. So I've turned, it's in, it's a little adventure. When I pull the coins out, it's like, do I find any old coins? So I happen to have a nickel from 1936. So one year that was his birthday present. I wrapped it up. Yeah. So those of you who don't know, um, Buffett was six years old in 1936. So I sent him, a, I wrapped the, the, the nickel up very, like it was a coin collector nickel. It wasn't, I just found it. But I wrapped it up very nicely. And with a birthday card, I said, Dear Warren, uh, happy birthday. Um, uh, this is your allowance. Spend it wisely. <laughs> uh, and that was his allowance. Yeah. It, was, it was his allowance. He was also earning money, of course, as you know. Um, and he, he shot me back uh, something that very few people in the world have ever gotten. Do you know what I got? I don't know if I told you. No. This. Okay. An email. Oh, awesome. See, you know that, right? He doesn't do yeah, email, yeah. right? So I've gotten I've gotten a few. And I, they're more, those of you who don't know, Buffett the, religiously does not do email. Um Anyway, so he said, Dear Adam, uh, thanks so much. Uh, I'm thinking hard about how to spend my allowance. So that book, How Not to Be Stupid, and he endorsed it, was his Christmas present one year. And and so the endorsement is, um, uh, this book is loaded with good ideas and appropriate warnings. Mm -hmm. And I I gave you a copy and also gave Tim a copy, Tim Ferriss. And Tim read it and he said, oh, wow, Adam, this is, this is a good book, but could you shorten some of the examples and provide more non-obvious advice? And that rankled a bit. I went, eh, what do you mean non-obvious? And Tim's a great, a great friend, right? So you have Buffett who said, Adam, get this out into the world. Yeah. I'm giving you an endorsement. I don't give anybody endorsements. Here, get this out in the world. And Tim, who said, um, that seems kind of obvious. So two people I respect. One said, this is so important. The other one going, but it's, it's kind of obvious. I, I sat with that and I realized, I say this affectionately, uh, Tim was being stupid about stupidity. He was dismissing, so I define stupidity as overlooking or dismissing conspicuously crucial information. And Tim was dismissing it. He was dismissing it as kind of obvious, what I was saying. Mm -hmm. Now, 
if he had thought a little more, he would, by the way, I'm not critiquing Tim on this. I'm not whatsoever because it sent me down a rabbit hole and I learned a ton. Tim could have said, Adam Buffett said, get this book out there. I'm going to give you an endorsement. And yet it seems obvious to me. So what am I missing? He didn't say that. He assumed he knew it already. And think about, so I realized that the, the key insight was that all, Buffett said this book is loaded with good ideas and appropriate warnings, warnings. Mm -hmm. And I know something that Buffett maybe didn't think about. Human beings always ignore warnings. Mm -hmm. They always do. And, and so they dismiss it. They go, yeah, whatever. Um, that's true, by the way, even on um, medicine bottles. You know, it says, uh, uh, warning, uh, uh, this medication may affect your uh, mental and physical functioning. Uh, if affected, do not operate heavy machinery or drive, right? And um, most people think that that doesn't apply to them. Yes. They go, oh, whatever. Like, That's for other people. Exactly right, for other people. Like, yeah, they may be affected, and but I'll know if I'm affected and I'm fine, right? Mm -hmm. And the warning should say, if you don't think this is affecting you, you are definitely affected, Buster. You know, pull over, don't drive. Anyway, so, so I sat with that question, why do human beings ignore warnings? And it's a really key one. And it's key, especially for you, Shane, um, is that all advice is a warning. All wisdom is a warning. If I say the best way to, um, to boil an egg is this, there's an implicit warning. If you don't boil it like that, the egg is not going to be as good as it could have been. Yeah. Right? If I say the best way to negotiate a contract is to always let them make the first offer. There's a warning. If you make the first offer, you're not going to get as good a result. Yep. So, and that goes back to learning. Why do people, I will tell you flat out. So what, are, what did I conclude? And then I'm going to get to have an announcement I'll share with you if you, if you're game for it. So, um, um, is people always learn the wrong lesson because they think either about themselves or about other people. They, they read something in the newspaper about somebody doing something outrageous. They, they go, oh, I would never do that. That's, that's why people don't learn, is they can't imagine themselves in that situation. So you'll remember at the beginning of the book, I talked about musicians who had lost their instruments. Yo-Yo Ma. Exactly right. So those of you who don't know, in 1999, Yo-Yo Ma, Yo -Yo Ma, the great P uh, cellist, left his cello in the back of a cab. And this was front page New York Times, you know, loses a $3 million Stradivarius, you know. And by the way, back then, it, it, it's worth way more than three million. It's what he would never sell it because it's his. But if someone, someone would be willing to pay $3 million for it, but he would never sell it. For, anyway, anyway, yeah. about nine months later, another musician in exactly the same circumstances loses, forgets his violin in the back of a car, exactly the same situation. And he had read about Yo-Yo Ma. So I'm going to ask you a question. This is a, like a pop quiz for Shane. And I did research, there are like a dozen famous musicians who all lost their instruments, almost exactly the same situation. Always after a performance, always when traveling, um, and, and so on. And uh, after Yo-Yo Ma lost his uh, instrument, Shane, I'm asking you, let's say you're a world famous violinist and you read about Yo-Yo Ma has lost his instrument. And then you read another uh, cellist, you read about another virtuoso who's lost his Stradivarius. What lesson would you, Shane, 
conclude? I'm just asking you. Don't overthink it. Like, what do you think most people not, would conclude? It's not going to apply to me. Oh, that's interesting. Most people would say, oh, I better be careful with my instrument. Oh. Oh, see, you're very smart. Well, you're, okay, well, you're very wise. Most people would go, oh, I better be more careful with my instrument in that situation. But one of the musicians, Philippe Quint, lost his and he knew about all the other musicians who had lost theirs. Do you know what he concluded, Shane? What? He concluded that none of them had lost their instruments. He concluded they were publicity stunts. Huh. He so could not imagine. That somebody, yeah. That you know, there's no way yo Ma, because that would crush him. It would devastate him for years. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. But notice, but it's not so crazy. He, 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 he himself dismissed it. Goes, they didn't really lose their instruments. He should. The question mm -hmm. he should have said is, if they lost theirs, under what circumstances might I lose mine? That's not the lesson he drew. So I have to yeah. write in a chapter into into the um, into the uh, um, into the book. into the book. That, that warns people of that. that. That is a great place to end this conversation, Adam. I'm so pleased uh, again to talk to you and your generosity with your time and, and your commitment now publicly to getting this book out yeah. is, uh, is a wonderful gift. Thank you. You're so welcome. Had a blast, Shane.